Okay, it's it's live. Hello, good evening, uh, good afternoon to um, uh, all our um, uh, fellows uh, in the Tough Africa Leadership Academy, and also good evening to to anybody who's connected um, uh, to listen to our honoured guests, uh, who is nobody other than uh, Dr. Keba Marina. So Dr. Keba Marina today is going to give us a lecture on, on confidence. As, as you know, um, doctor performed the first knee transplant. Was there a knee transplant that he performed in the Gambia successfully, him and his team? So I guess um, uh, one, we want to first start by congratulating him, you know, performing, you know, such a difficult task. And also I'm sure he's very proud with his team that for the first time in the Gambia, we have had such a um, uh, major challenge overcome. So I'm sure it is with confidence that he did this. So there's no better time to get him come on board, share his experience, you know, talk to these young fellows, you know, on the uh, subject of, you know, confidence in a position of leadership. So, Doctor, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, um, Alpha is gonna share your bio. You know, so normally we'll just read your bio, so people will know who you are, okay. and then um, we will we will now allow you to do your presentation. Uh, when you are ready, it'll be interactive. We will get um, um, also fellows or people who are on YouTube Live or Facebook to be asking questions. And since it's Ramadan, I think um, we're going to make sure that probably in the next hour, one hour, 15 minutes, or one hour, 30 minutes at most, that we finish. So Alpha, can we have the, the bio share? Done. Yeah, so Dr. Keba S. Marena is Gambian, is Gambia's first orthopedic surgeon. He studied medicine at Imperial College London, qualifying in 2006, and proceeded to complete his care surgical training in the east of England, what's it called, uh, Danery, as a registrar. He specialized in orthopedics over three years at King's College Hospital NHS Foundation Trust, and four years at Brighton and Sussex University Hospitals, NHS Trust, both teaching hospitals and level one major trauma centers. He was then admitted as fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, FRCS, and then in brackets, uh, whatever, in 2017. He has a wide range of experience in orthopedics, especially trauma, but also covering all major subspecialties, including pediatrics, orthopedics, joint replacement surgery, hand surgery, and spinal surgery. After achieving his FRCS, he spent a further specialty year training in pelvic and acetabular trauma surgery combined with complex and revision orthoplasty, this is orthoplasty as hip and knee replacement surgery. He is also a holder of a postgraduate diploma in muscular skeletal science. Dr. Marina has appoint, was appointed as consultant in trauma and orthopedics at the Edwards Francis Small Teaching Hospital in the Gambia in August, 2018 and is currently the lead surgeon in the department. Dr. Marina is involved in teaching at the undergraduate level as a lecturer at the University of the Gambia and also American International University, West Africa. He also he is also involved in postgraduate teaching of junior doctors, teaching on national causes, and is also currently the deputy program coordinator for the WAS, which is West African College of Surgeons, 
surgery residency program at the Edwards Francis Small Teaching Hospital. Doctor, what a bio. You make us all proud and the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. I just need to be able to share my PowerPoint. Okay, so hopefully the screen share is working okay. It is, yes. Thank you. So thank you for the nice introduction and the bio. Um, so as we've, we've said, the talk today is regarding confidence. And I think confidence is a very important part of success. If you look at anybody who's successful, um, my host, uh, Taf, amongst many others, confidence is a key to them achieving this, this success. It's very difficult to be successful without having some amount of confidence. So it's an important topic and I think hopefully I will do it some justice today. I'd like to start off by just defining confidence. And if you look in a dictionary, what is it that you see when you look at confidence? If you look at the Oxford Dictionary, for example, it says that it's a feeling or belief that one can have faith in or rely on someone or something. However, for me, when we come to, when we talk about confidence, really, it's about the someone. And that someone is yourself. It's not necessarily relying on confidence of others. It's about relying on yourself and having faith in yourself. And I'll talk about that a bit more. So the second definition from the Cambridge Dictionary, the quality of being certain of your abilities, of having trust in people, plans, or the future, I feel is a bit more appropriate. Your abilities being the key here, is what can you do and being confident in yourself. One, the way I'm going to go through this, majority of this PowerPoint is just some quotes on confidence that I'm going to share. So what is confidence? We've defined it, but what does confidence mean to you? You know, what does confidence mean to me? What should confidence mean? For me, confidence is a driving force. It's something that pushes you, something that makes you be able to do something. There's a quote that says, experience tells you what to do, but confidence allows you to do it. You, we all go to school, we all go through college, university, and so on, and we acquire skills along the way. But being able to apply them, being able to use them, requires this confidence. That is what allows you to be able to make the best of these things that you've done throughout your life, these experiences, these skills that you get. It's that confidence, that's that driving force that helps you push that through. Confidence is a belief. It's not necessarily another quote. It isn't optimism or pessimism. And it's not necessarily a character attribute. It's the expectation of a positive outcome. And some of these quotes are a little bit deep, but if you think about them, and I think, I believe you'll get the slides afterwards, you will start to make sense of them when you try and process confidence in your own mind as to what it is. It's the expectation of a positive outcome. So one way I like to think about confidence <clears throat> is that there are two types in a way. There are some people who are just naturally confident. They are born confident. But I believe that you can also learn confidence. You can be taught confidence. It's not everybody that naturally has it. So it's not necessarily a character attribute, but it's something that you can inculcate in yourself. It's for me, you need to understand it. You need to understand the use of it and the application of it and try to make yourself confident in a way. It's about self. It's about knowing your own value. And I think this is very important. 
nobody should define to you what your value is. And I will give, just talk about my experiences <clears throat> as well. And you see some of that coming out. It's about knowing your own worth. So it's believing in yourself, feeling comfortable with who you are and recognizing that you have worth. There's nobody that doesn't have worth, but it's about recognizing it. Some people have it and don't realize they have it. And rather, everybody has it, but is realizing what it is. We all have worth in different things, but you need to be able to find that within yourself. It's a self-exploration exercise in a way. Now, we talk about confidence a lot, and we talk about what it means, but some of it is an application thing. As I said, it's not always an innate thing. With confidence, you also need to have preparation. Empty confidence isn't going to get you very far. It comes from knowing what you're doing. If you're prepared for something, then usually you can do it. If you're not prepared, then often you fail. And this is another quote. So as well and as long as everything else you have, your skills, your knowledge, and your confidence, but still, you still need to prepare. Being overconfident is not useful either. There are limits to it, and there is a thin line. And I say this again, it is a personal thing. You are the only person on earth who can use your ability. No one else can use it for you. No one else can unlock your potential for you. But only you can do this yourself. One of my favorites, I call it fake it till you make it. So confidence is key. But sometimes you need to look like you're confident, even when you're not. There are few people who will tell you that there's no situation in that they haven't felt uncomfortable or lacking confidence. But a lot of the time, you have to tell yourself that you are confident, tell yourself that you're okay. And that positively reinforces it, the physical and the mental aspect of it, so that you then get to that stage of being confident. And I don't apologize for keep on telling you about self because it always comes back to self and self-belief. It's how strongly you believe that you really can is what will play the biggest part in determining if you actually will. As I said earlier, there is a thin line. A lot of people do confuse confidence with arrogance and think that the two maybe are together, but there is a separation but sometimes it is a very fine line and you have to learn how to toe that line. People like a confident person, but nobody likes an arrogant person. Here I've got two quotes. One says that the best kind of confidence is a classical, like a classical virtue. It strikes the golden mean as in the middle path between self-doubt and arrogance. So you have to bring yourself away from the self-doubt to, self to the point of confidence, but not straying too far that you go on the side of arrogance. It allows you to embody your positive traits without bragging about them. And I think that's, this is something that a lot of us struggle to do. I think myself even, I usually very rarely speak about myself or my achievements or things that I've done for the fear that people might see it as arrogance. But you still have to be able to think about the things that you've done positively. And that helps you build your confidence, whether it's internal or external. If you don't feel that what you're doing is right, what you're doing is positive, what you're doing is good, then it does erode on your confidence. You have to believe in it yourself. And then the other quote is confidence is when you believe in yourself and your abilities. Arrogance is when you think you're better than others, others and act accordingly. So, I said, it's all about quotes today, different quotes that you can take something from. This is the one that I like. Confidence comes not from always being right, but from fearing, but from not fearing to be wrong. And it is very easy to doubt yourself 
but sometimes you just have to believe that you are doing the right thing and you're on the right path and continue down that line. At this point, I'm just going to just give a brief history about myself. I'm going to go all the way back to high school, maybe even from when things started. So you've heard about, um, you've heard the bio, um, and also you've heard about the knee replacement. But how did we get there? You know, I'm hoping it's not the pinnacle of what I'm going to achieve. I think I hopefully can say that with some certainty. But you know, it's up there at the moment with so far what I have done. But how did we get to that point? How did Keba Marana get to where he, where he is now? And I hope this will show you that some amount of confidence or confidence is key, is core to achieving. I, um, I went to Marina School. I'm sure everybody knows the school. This was uh, many years ago now, in the 90s. Uh, we were amongst the first batch who sat the then, what they called the IGCSE, which was an international GCSE exam uh, set by Cambridge. I think we were the second lot to do it. And I mean, I enjoy, I, I was a science student. I enjoyed a lot of the science subjects. And when it came to choosing subjects, there were some that I just didn't want to let go. A group of four of us, I believe it was, decided we want to do additional maths. At that time, we were told that that was nine subjects and that was too much. We should probably stick to eight. The results from the previous year were not so good. You know, maybe we should concentrate on our eight subjects and make sure that we pass those ones well. But we decided that no, this was something we wanted to do. It was something that would be useful to us. So we were going to do it. We, start, we were told that we had to do it as an extracurricular uh, subject, which we accepted. And we would come on weekends and evenings to do the ad maths. We had a teacher then, Mr. Cole, who was then the headmaster. Um, and after a few weeks or months, I believe, he unfortunately suffered a stroke. So we were then left without a teacher. And essentially, we had to then go through the rest of this year teaching ourselves this additional maths to be able to come out and pass because we insisted ourselves that we were going to do it and registered for it. And that's what we did. We had confidence in our abilities that this was something we could achieve. We went through the year, finished, and I got to say we all passed, all four of us. I graduated um, having done all nine subjects with a distinction, which was at the time the first ever distinction from Marina in the IGCSE. I'm happy to say that there have been several since then. So at least things are not stagnating. And I don't want to be <laughs> at the pinnacle. Things have to improve behind you. I think it also is good to, in a way, set the path so that other people have belief that there's something that they can do or something that they can follow. And if you see good things coming after you, then that is always a good thing. I then left uh, the Yanga and I went to the UK, where I went to sixth form, to uh, Loughborough Grammar School, it was called. And I chose science subjects, maths, biology, chemistry. And it was a very interesting time in my life because going throughout high school, I was always the top of my class. I very rarely came out of the top three. I got to this college, which was a highly acclaimed college. Uh, and most of my classmates were also high achievers. In fact, very high achievers. I remember one of the, uh, class, one of the classmates I had, who's also now a doctor, in his GCSEs, I think did 10 subjects and dropped two marks in total. He was two marks shy of being perfect in every single subject. And that was the kind of class that I was in. But that didn't intimidate me because I knew what I could do. I knew what I was to achieve and I was going to continue doing that. Being in a foreign country, being black, it's not always easy. I remember our first chemistry, first term exam. I scored an A, but 
it was a lowish A. It wasn't a very high one. And the teacher called me after the class because I didn't realize this. I'm quiet. I sit, tend to sit in the back of the class. I don't say very much. And some of the things they were doing were things I'd already done, which was why I was not necessarily participating so much. But I didn't realize that they just looked at me and thought, okay, this is a student from Africa. He probably doesn't know very much. He's not going to achieve more than a C or a D. So we just continue teaching. And he was shocked when he saw the expression on my face in that class when I got my result and my A was in the high A. Because he thought I'd be very happy with that grade. And he called me and said to me, actually, I've gone back and looked over your file. And I think I judged you wrong. But it's seeing in you that you know that you can do far more than this that made me realize that actually, you know, you can achieve more. And when it came to giving my predicted grades, which you needed to get into medical school to apply, he said that regardless of my grades, he would predict me A's because he was sure that I could achieve it. Similarly, uh, this is still going way back. We're talking 1999 now. <laughs> Some of the memories are a little bit hazy. But I remember in our maths class as well, again, when we did pure maths, I had done ad maths, so everything in pure maths I'd done before. So again, that teacher always just saw me as the quiet person in the class and assumed I wasn't following, I wasn't keeping up. Until one day we were doing quadratic equations and he asked me to come up and solve it. So I stepped up to the board and solved the quadratic equation. And I remember when, he, when I started, they thought I was doing it wrong because it was a way that they'd never been taught before. Even the teacher was a bit taken aback. And when I proved that with every equation, the way I was taught and the way I was able to do it worked. We even got to the point where when it came to solving it, sometimes he would even say, you can do it this way or you can use Keba's way. And that used to became a way there was Keba's way of solving it. So again, it was an unwavering confidence in a way. You know, I was taught it, I knew it, I have got my A's and A stars, and I was sure that what I was doing was right. So even when I was called into question, I proved it over and over again that this works because I had belief in myself. I graduated with three A's and went on to Imperial College London, uh, which was at the time and still is at least, was in the top five universities in the world and currently still within the top 10, if I remember the rankings. As alumni, you keep checking back to see that your university hasn't dropped out of where it used to be. And we're still, it's still up there. I spent six years in medical school, graduating in 2006. Uh, still did manage to do academically reasonably well. Uh, get, got some merits along the way. And became a doctor in 2006. At this stage, we started working and what you have to do is specialization. We did our foundation years, at which point I applied for core surgical training. And it was usually quite rare for, well, I'm gonna try to put this in a political -like manner, but having black students or black surgeons was still a rare thing. Even when I left the UK, we had a black surgeons network because it wasn't, it's not that common. And there may be some inherent biases, uh, but I remember going to interview with a friend of mine who is Nigerian, but we went to school in Gambia together and followed a similar path. And we drove there together. And I remember just telling him and he was actually usually a very confident person, but on that day, he was really doubting himself. And I had, we, we had this talk and I said to him, you know, we haven't got this way by chance. We haven't got this far by chance. We have got this far through our hard work and through being sure and being confident in our abilities. Let's go in there and show them that these two people from Marina, from different background can do it. And we both came out with what they call training numbers. So we both had core surgical training numbers. I did my two years core training, and then we have to reapply again for what 
for the orthopedics, which was the special surgery that I wanted to do. Unfortunately, by this stage, uh, due to immigration laws and some changes in the way they took up students, I was not able to get a training number. But I knew that this was not because of my ability. I was confident that my ability was not the reason why I didn't get a training number, but there was other factors against me. So I didn't stop there. What I decided to do was in a way for my own training program. They have two paths. They have a path, which is a national path where you have a number, you go along through the years and at the end you sit the exam and qualify. And then there was another path for usually for international graduates, people come from elsewhere to prove that they still have the relevant skills. So I got a job and I spoke to my employers and I said to them, this is what I want to do. And they said, luckily I was in a place where they said, fine, we will see how we can help you achieve that. I did all my rotations, did my numbers of surgeries. Uh, I think before you able to sit the exam, you have to do about 2000 surgeries or so in your logbook. So I finished everything, did all that, put that together and submitted my file. And they accepted that I had the required level of knowledge and the required level of experience to go ahead and sit my exam. And I sat my exam, the written exam, and I passed. So I thought, I'm almost there now, just one more to go. And I had a, um, the practical exam to go which I registered for. And in my mind, so one of the things to say was, my plan was always to come back to Gambia. I wasn't going to come back without reaching the highest level in terms of specialization. So for me, when I had finished my specialization, that's when I was going to come home. I know that if I came home to Gambia at any stage, I would still be the orthopedic doctor. I would be this, I'd be that, and nobody else had done it. But still, for me, it was important for me to be at the top of the top of my trade, if you put it that way. So I rushed and sat for the second part of the exam, and I failed. And I think there's a lesson there that it's not it's not always smooth. I know I painted you a rosy picture, and sometimes you have hiccups along the way. But what brings you back? is the confidence. I remember the day I got my result. This was, it was a painful time because the exam, you, you spend about 2000 pounds to register for the exam. And I remember when I got the email telling me I hadn't passed, I had 24 hours to register for the very next session in three months or not. And I was so that I went straight away and paid 1,800. Because I said, I'm not going to let this beat me. I'm going right in again, and I'm going to do it again. One of my seniors had to persuade me and said to me, actually, maybe take your time. I know you want to do this. I know you want to finish and get home. But just take your time and recoup and come back, which I did. I delayed it three months and eventually went back for the exam. And this time around, passed. So for me, that was where I then became fully specialized from an orthopedic surgeon. At the time, of course, I was the first Gambian to have ever done this. No one else had done it before. Along my way in school, a lot of the things I had in medical school and specializing, a lot of the things I had thought about doing were things that would always help the country. Because I said to myself that I'm going to make a difference somehow. I remember when I was doing this is going back uh, when I was in medical school, I came home and I realized that um, liver cancer was a big burden because of the groundnut issue <clears throat> and hepatitis. So I ended up doing a BSc in hepatology because I decided maybe I could be the one. when I found out about the maternal mortality. So I know you hear about it a lot now, but it wasn't new. Even as far back as 2007, 8 maternal mortality was 
very terrible in the country. So at that point, I said to myself, maybe I should become an uh, obstetrician, <laughs> gynecologist. And I did start down that path a little way, but my heart did tell me that, no, I think there are other areas I can still make a difference. They may not be the headline grabbers. They may not be the ones everybody hears about, but I followed my heart and my mind and I went into the orthopedics, which is where I am now. I then decided it was time to come home. So I came back to, I always come, I've always been coming back to Gambia, but I started going to the hospital a lot more, try and find out what I was getting myself into. I went to a department which was in its infancy, I would say, and not looking like it was going anywhere. So I knew that if I had to come back into that, I had to do something about it. I couldn't just up and leave from a place where I had everything at my disposal, able to do any operation I could think about, to coming home and not having anything and struggling and getting rejected. Because for me, this was a one way. I was going to come and there was no going back. So I started coming every three months and evaluating how things were and making small changes as I could. Money is always an issue. I did some fundraising sometimes to get a drill. I believe it, they had no drill, uh, amongst other things. But also trying to get partnerships because I believe that it's not something I could do on my own. And I had to work with others, people from outside even, to be able to achieve what I wanted to achieve. I came home in 2008, August, and continued work on improving this department, working on training others and deciding that why, or thinking about why I was the first. There must have been something that all the graduates of the, of the medical school, no one wants to do orthopedics and what's happening there. So that's what really made me get into lecturing because I thought that if I could get to these students early, get them to understand what real orthopedics is and what it can do, that maybe more people will get involved. And I was happy that I managed to get three doctors who were very keen after having worked with me or watching me or heard about me that came in to join me to also be taught. And some of them now are on further training. So what we're doing is building department and building capacity. But all that comes from believing that it was possible. And also believing in my abilities to be able to do that. I could have come in, thought I was out of my depth and easily given up and gone back to my comfort zone. But I really did leave a comfort zone. It's, it's a very different area working in the UK and working in Gambia. And being able to take that leap, brave leap, I would say, um, did require some amount of belief in what I could do. But it was never going to take off. It was never going to improve without me driving it, without me being the driving force. Uh, fast forward to 2020. If you go to 2019, I did the first hip replacement in the country. Since then, we've done almost 20 or so. But again, there was a lot of work that goes into it. In the UK, all I have to do is say I'm doing a hip replacement and everything is there. Here, I have to get everything down to the last detail. I remember when we did the first hip replacement, I had to go and sit down and write a very detailed list of detailed plan for, and gave it to everybody, <clears throat> all the theatre staff, everybody working with me, so that everybody knew what we were going to do. And essentially micromanage how we we're going to do things. But that's how they learn. And they also feed, people also feed off your confidence. Confidence, as I say, is contagious. Self-doubt is also contagious. If the people around you don't feel that you actually believe in what you're doing and that you're confident in what you're doing, then you're not going to get them to join you. You're not going to get them to come along with you and help you be better. Nothing that I have achieved, I have achieved on my own. Everything has been with teamwork and with the team around me. But I think having that person there that they can all feed off in terms of the confidence makes us all better and makes the team better. 
we did the knee replacement. Um, and again, it was a slightly bigger operation than the hip replacement. And this is the one that got the, um, I should say, got the media attraction. But, you know, there are other things that we have been doing. But I think this is just, just a brief rundown of my journey from where things started to where I am today. And hopefully you will see um, the confidence coming out. One thing I'd also like to stress about confidence, you know, how, I said, how I said that it's contagious and self-doubt is as well. But it's about not comparing yourself to others. You know, I told you about my experience in sixth form where I went from being the top of the class to being with people who maybe in a sense academically were far better than me. But I didn't let that get to me. I could have easily got demoralized and thought, actually, I haven't achieved anything or achieved much by thinking about what others were doing. But I focused on myself. And that's why I said I, have no, I give no apologies for repeatedly talking about the self part of confidence. It comes from you and don't, you don't get your confidence from others. You get it from within. And it's about what you believe that you can achieve yourself. So to round off, do more quotes. When we feel confident in ourselves, we're able to trust in our own abilities, our own qualities, and our judgment. A quote from Marcus Garvey. If you have no confidence in self, you are twice defeated in the race of life. And I think this is important um, for everybody to think about and digest because we all have our struggles. We all have things that are in our way and there are things that can defeat you. We all get defeated sometimes. It's natural, it's normal. And that's one defeat that you already have to face. If you don't have confidence, then you're defeating yourself twice. With self-confidence or confidence in self, you at least have one up on the defeats and the hurdles in front of you. Backgrounds are different. Everyone comes from different backgrounds. I'm sure all of those in the leadership academy come from varying backgrounds. But that shouldn't define what you are able to achieve. Yes, some people come from a more privileged background, but still, you have to work to get to where you want to be. Even with everything at your feet, you have to work. And if you have nothing at your feet, you still have to work. You have to have the confidence that you can achieve. You have to set your goals and say, this is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. And then think about how you're going to do it. And more often than not, if you do that and you have that conviction, you will get there and you will achieve it. So to end, this essentially in a nutshell encapsulates everything that I've just said. As is our confidence, so is our capacity. Your confidence defines what you are going to do and what you're going to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. I mean, um, uh, well said, uh, well presented. I mean, actually, I'm inspired. I, I've listened and uh, you saw me shaking my head because I, I believe in what you're saying. Uh, at this point, um, uh, I would like to uh, just take some few questions, um, uh, mainly from the fellows. Uh, we have one that comes from uh, um, Suleiman Gay. He says, uh, thank you, doctor, for the amazing lecture. And uh, his question is, when you and your team were about to perform the first knee replacement surgery at the EFSTH, did your confidence level rose beyond your belief that there is a possibility of failure in it? Uh, thank you, Rex. Um, I think uh, it's a good question. I think you have to doubt. Doubt always comes into it because if you if you think about you have no doubt at all. You have to know what the limitations are, what the issues are, in order to allow your confidence to control them. Uh, when we were planning to do the first knee replacement, I did have my doubts. 
not that whether it'd be successful, the doubt was never in my ability to, to conduct it. The doubt was in the materials and the infrastructure and everything we had around us and whether it was possible. So to counteract that, what I did was I took a long time to decide to do this and I planned and planned, as you see what I said at the start in the talk, planning goes hand in hand with confidence. Because if you don't plan, then that's when you will fail. So with the planning, I think that tends to then erode the doubts because you identify them, you plan, you mitigate for them, and then you execute. Yeah, excellent. Now, Maria, da Maria Madabo says, what's your biggest challenge that you've tackled through confidence? Uh, I would say maybe public speaking even. <laughs> Is it Sorry, say it again. Public speaking would uh, be one. So as I said to you, I've always been quiet, reserved. I don't tend to say very much. And I think the first few times um, I struggled or I wondered how I would cope. But sometimes you also do forget things that are within you. And I actually sit down and have conversations with myself and, and talk to myself about how I'm going to deal with things. And I remember thinking back as to how when I was in primary school, I used to be, I used to write stories and I used to even perform them. I was an actor. So of course, something changed along the way um, where I used to do these acting things and be on stage and talk about things and something changed. And the confidence came from telling myself that it's within me. I've done this before. And maybe along the line, something changed, but there's no reason why I can't do it again. So I started making myself believe that I can do this. And then when you do it and don't fail, and then you get also positive reactions from it, you feed off the positivity and it helps you get better. Excellent. I'm a uh, Chukumeka. Uh, this is my, sounds like my Igbo, Igbo family, huh? but I'm sure you know him. He says, uh, good evening, Doc. Thank you so much. This is Emeka. Please, did you have uh, imposter syndrome and how did you deal with it? Did you have any ritual or practice? Uh, <clears throat> I think imposter syndrome sort of refers to when you you almost feel like you don't fit in or you feel like you are pretending to fit into a situation where you don't. And if I'm honest, I would say, no, I don't think I had imposter syndrome because wherever I was and whatever I did, I never felt or never let anybody make me believe that I wasn't the right fit. So throughout, whether it was in school or even in my training, I always felt that my abilities will come through. What I'm able to do will eventually show. And eventually people think that maybe I don't fit in. I will show them that actually I do. And I, even in, uh, when I was training, I used to take all the foreign doctors under my wing because I see how you could get broken down very easily when you get there and things are different. And it's never because of your, um, your ability but it's just because you're different. And that difference people will pick on and start make, and make you think that you are not good enough. And I would always give them pep talks and say to them, yeah. you are good, you can do this. Don't worry about what people think about you. Just keep doing you. Even if there's resistance at first, there's opposition at first. When you continue to show them that you are good, they will accept you. And I always live by that. I just kept doing what I believed, and I think they would always come around. And in the places I've worked, even when I was working, they did say to me, are you sure you want to go home? Because if not, we have a job for you. And that was from a beginning where people would doubt me. And like I say, because of my quietness, people always did doubt me. And some people say my voice also makes me not sound like someone who's intelligent. But So the, doubt, <laughs> the doubts will always be there, but you have to prove people wrong. Oh, great. Um, Ibrahim Asanyan says, what's your driving force? Meaning, uh, what keeps you going? What keeps me going now is the need to make the, the need, the, how do I put it? Wanting to make a difference. 
I think um, I'm sure all those in Gambia will know that there, there can be a lot of frustrations when you're in Gambia and working in Gambia. And sometimes I, I take time out in my head. As you go through your day to day, a lot of the things you think about, you feel like you're not moving, you feel like you're walking in mud and everything is very difficult. But you have to take stock. You have to step back and say to yourself, if I look back one year ago, for example, have I made a difference? And almost always the answer is yes. And that's what keeps me going. Because in the here and now, I don't feel like anything is moving me. I don't feel like I'm making a difference. But even when I look back to six months ago, things have changed. You know, tomorrow I might be frustrated, but I can look back at the fact that we did the first knee replacement. I can look back at other things that have been done. I say that, yes, actually, it may be frustrating now, but I am making a difference. And that's what continues to drive me. Excellent, excellent. Ibrahim, I think, says again, um, uh, um, uh, Doctor, how, how can Gambia create more Dr. Mariners? How can you duplicate yourself? How can you clone yourself? <laughs> I think that there are a lot more, a lot more Dr. Mariners out there. To be honest, I'm pretty sure I'm not alone. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of it does come down to your environment and your upbringing and your attitude in life. Um, one thing my father always told us was, "Whatever you do in life, do it well." As he would say, even if you're going to be a fool, be the best fool that there can be. So it's about, and that, that was always in my mind. So I always strive to be the best at whatever I do. But I think patriotism, being good at what you do and having belief in your abilities is what we all need. And I'm sure there's lots of people that have it. And sometimes application is the problem. And sometimes you just need a break to help you to get there. But I'm sure there's a lot more on Dr. Myers and there will be a lot more. Like I said, if, for me, I failed if, when I leave, not, nobody comes behind me and follows my trail. As I say to the doctors that I work with, whenever someone posts, I don't post my own achievements, but someone will, <clears throat> will post it on the page and they'll say, congrats, we want to be like you. And I say, no, you're going to be better than me. I don't want any of you to be like me. I want all of you to be better than me and achieve more than I've achieved. What I have done should just be setting the way for you you should do better than what I have done. And I strongly believe that if we, we shouldn't think about tearing people down or beating what people do, I think we should really strive to push each other further. If I can get up the ladder and I pull someone else above me and put them up, then I've done something good. If I climb the ladder and look down at them, then I'm not doing the right thing. Well, let me, let me also take you on now. This is from me. I mean, you've mentioned that um, you don't post what you, your achievements. You allow others to do it for you. So you're basically saying you don't tell your own story. Why don't you tell your own story? Don't you think you can tell it better? Yes. Sure, I, I, could, I could tell it better. Um, I think maybe it's on, on some level, part, part of it is also... So for this, what this knee the whole media around it showed me was that something that I feel not is insignificant, but I don't feel is such a great achievement, maybe because of my perspective on things, to other people can be very inspiring. And I have learned from that because I realized that maybe for me, where I set my sights is a little bit higher. And if I don't achieve that, I'm just achieving a regular thing. But to other people, it may not be regular. And to other people, the small things can inspire them. Or maybe it's not even a small thing. But maybe that's just my expectation. So I, I have learned from that. And I do think that I will try and do it more. And tell your own story, huh? Yeah? Yes, tell my own story. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, let me tell you, doctor, I am a believer of telling my own story. Because I don't want nobody to, to misinterpret my story. Or, or, you know, so I should be the one who should really tell my story. You should sell yourself. And that also gives a lot of confidence, you know, applies a lot of confidence in yourself. I mean, we all have different school of thought, but I am a strong believer of, you know, one telling his own story because you did it, don't shy away from it. 
Anyway, okay, let's continue with the questions. Um, uh, maybe another 10 minutes, because for us here is getting close to Iftara. Huh? So, so it says, um, has failure ever threatened your journey to where you are? If yes, how did you overcome such state? Failure has threatened it. Um, like I said, I wouldn't say that I've always done amazingly throughout school academically. I have had a few mm -hmm. hiccups along the way. But I always sit down and ask myself, you know, if I failed an exam, why did I fail? And you can always say why. You know, mm -hmm. maybe I didn't prepare enough. It's not because of me and it's not that I cannot do it. It's because I didn't do X or Y properly. And if I address that, then the next time around it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I also strongly believe is faith. I always tell people, and I know not everybody can see it like that in the moment, but my strong belief is if I look at where I am today and I'm happy, then every failure along the path has got me to where I want to be today. So tomorrow when I have a failure, I don't see it as a failure. I see it as something along the path that's going to continue getting me to where I want to be. There are positives in everything and not everything you should feel so much as a failure. Some things change your path and actually put you into a better place later. Great, yeah, Sally Jiang says, is there any situation you find yourself that made you lose your confidence? And how do you regain confidence in that moment? I think we'll just share the part two there. So um, losing confidence, yes. I mean, as a surgeon, you know, not, not every time everything you do goes right. And sometimes we have complications, sometimes you have bad cases. And then you, I wouldn't call it lose your confidence, but you do have a fear. And fear is a good thing, I think. As long as you harness it and you use it properly. So yeah. if I have a complication, then I'll go home and I'll pick up my book. Or I'll, uh, sometimes I use Twitter. And I'll ask the medical Twitter, you know, what would you do in this situation? And get some either positive reinforcement or get ideas as what I can do differently next time. And I just make sure that when I go back, I do not make the same mistake or have the same problem because I've taken the time to use this fear of being wrong. Oh, excellent. Um, uh, okay, I'll take the second to last question here. It says, hello, doctor. Indeed, it's a great lecture. And then it is always the case, is it always the case to be confident? Uh, sorry, um, is it always the case to be confident, especially knowing that you are dealing with patients' lives? As a surgeon, um, like I say, it's, it's one, you need to be confident, yes. But secondly, you also need to look like you're confident. Because often the surgeons that struggle the most, um, or doctors that struggle the most, is when the people around you also realize that you now are panicking or you are struggling. Because then it, it's, it's contagious. Everybody else has the same feeling. But when the person leading is confident or appears to be confident, it gives everybody else confidence. So that, that, that's how I deal with it. And I also tell people, you know, when we're, in, when we're in operations or whatever, I ask them, who's the most important person in this room? And when I first came and I used to ask that question, people would say, you are, ah, sir. And I'd say, no, I'm not. The most important person is the patient. So if you see me doing something wrong or you see something that I could do better, it doesn't matter who you are, what level you are, you can tell me because I'm not above realizing that I could change or I could do something in that moment. So I think having that whole um, ethos and that feeling around your team helps in general because people know they can say to you actually you you can do this different you can do this you can do that and also they feed off your confidence yeah and now another question we have is um uh, he says what, what is the relationship between confidence and, and nervousness uh i think even even when you're confident as i explained even when you're confident you can be nervous yeah but you overcome the nervousness by telling yourself that you can do this. You reinforce it. You keep telling yourself, no, I'm fine. Or I can do this. I've been in this situation before. And remind yourself how you've done it before. 
and then use that to your advantage. Great. There are many more, but doctor, I mean, we need to draw the curtain somewhere. Um, yeah. um, it's, it's Ramadan, and um, I just take the final one, and this is from Yankuba So, uh, Yankuba, Yankuba, Yankuba So, and he says, "What's your advice for young health practitioners to develop this confidence in order to improve our health sector?" I think you have to. One of the ways to improve it is, is to set realistic goals. Um, you have to decide what you want to achieve. And one of the things about confidence is not being overconfident. So you have to know what your particular skill set is, what your particular attribute is that you can use the most, what your best skill is. And then use that to do something. So. It's, it's not useful to say I'm going to do X and Y when you don't have the skills to do it or you don't have the knowledge or the you know attributes to do it. I think we have to also accept our weaknesses. That's a very important thing. Not everybody is a complete all-rounder in everything, whether it's um, emotionally or physically. And you have to know what your limitations are, what your weaknesses are, and you play to your strengths. Everybody has strengths, and that's why I believe in teamwork. I believe in forming a team where you don't do everything. I believe in delegating to people's strengths. And some people find that as a strange concept here, where when I'm made head of something, I will nominate deputies and say to them, I think you're good at X, you do that. Whereas people here always feel that they should do everything. And I think you have to learn to play to people's strengths. I know my strengths and I can work with my strengths. And the things I'm not strong at, I have people around me who can do those things. Excellent. Okay, this is just a comment uh, before I um, go into my, my closing remarks. It's from Omar Njai, and he says, I think um, uh, when we talk about confidence, uh, the world needs to hear your story. You never know who your story is going to become his or her greatest motivation. Because if you, if you impact one um, person, if you impact one person, you make a difference in the world. So that's just a, a comment on, on, on confidence. But doctor, I mean, I would, why don't I allow you to say your last words and then I will just wrap up and we'll then draw the curtain. So um, I think my last words are, we come from a small country. You often feel sometimes that you are insignificant or that you can't make a difference. And I'll tell you that's wrong. There are many Gambians all over the world doing amazing things. And abroad and back home. So don't think that you can't achieve much because of where you come from, what your background is, or what you have done so far. There's always a time to have a turning point. So believe in yourself, believe in your abilities. And trust me, we can all go far as Gambians. And there are people are doing it and we will continue to do it. Well, thank you so much. Doctor, we cannot thank you more. Um, um, it's been a ple pleasure. Actually, we had planned that our four last lecturers will all be female, all ladies. And um, uh, I just thought, look, let's, let's blend it a little bit. And uh, because of your recent achievements, I mean, we, we need to bring you in, uh, not only to the fellows, but you know, for the, for, the, for the topic itself, being confident. So these young fellows will learn from you that uh, Dr. Keba Marina that they know has performed this surgery. Uh, for you, probably it's not, it's not any big thing for who you are and your qualification. But all of us, including myself, you know, are so much proud of you uh, to see that this is the first time it's been done in the Gambia. You've broken the glass ceiling. And that actually inspires people to do more, not only in your own field, but also in every field that's possible, especially these young leaders. Um, uh, today, we have 100 fellows who are, who, are, who are on this program. This is the second cohort that we've been having. We've had the first one, and we started with 50. Um, the second one, the application, we had 300 and something who applied. So now we have um, 100 who are going to graduate um, in June, in the first week of June. You are the last who delivered the last lecture. Um, it's on leadership. And obviously on leadership, you need confidence to be a leader. You need to be confident to be a leader. And that's why you know we identify Gambians who's made a difference. So they look up to you, you know, that yes, I want to be a Dr. Marina. And that's what you have done today. So on behalf of the fellows, on behalf of myself as the president of the Tough Africa 
Foundation. And my staff, I say a big thank you. This is not the first time that we're gonna call on you. We're gonna call on you many, many, many more times so that these young Gambians who look up to you and me and others, you know, can have the right values of leadership inculcated in them. That's the way that we can make a difference. Then we'll multiply ourselves. So on that note, um, uh, I wish you a blessed Ramadan and um, praying for you in this last 10 days of Ramadan. And um, uh, to the others, well done fellows. This is our last lecture. We expect to see your, your submissions. Doctor, what they do is after your lecture, they will do a report of your lecture and then submit it. That's how it's done. So they're gonna compile 12 of them and we'll try to find a way of probably sharing on cloud so that probably, you know, people like yourself can go back and see what these young ones, you know, have learned from what you have told them. So again, thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.